next round table will explore the role of libraries in open access publishing, both at an institutional and at a consortia level. Um, uh, we are all, I know, uh, experimenting with and introducing new services, um, developing programs and infrastructure that push, begin, that's beginning to push that um, open publication dial. But we're all different, thankfully, um, I, I, and I and I strongly believe that we can all learn from each other, uh, which is essentially the purpose of this session. So, without much ado, let me um, introduce our, our first speaker, who is um, Gillian Daly. Gillian is the executive officer of the Scottish Federation of University and Research Libraries, that's SCIRL, um, based in the National Library of Scotland, uh, and and she supports SCIRL, of course, supports collaboration across Scottish academic um, and research, academic and research libraries. Gillian is the project manager for an initiative to, um, and I'm very jealous about this, for an initiative to establish a collaborative open access press, which is owned and managed by SCIRL member libraries. Okay, Gillian. Yeah, someone on chat loves Hi your there. guitars. <laughs> we all love your guitars. Yeah, I, I wish I could play a tune, but unfortunately, <laughs> uh, not quite mastered that yet. Um, okay, just let me uh, share these slides. And it always works perfectly well yeah. in um, rehearsal and then glitches when you go to do it in real life. Um, just bear with me a moment. Don't worry, Julia. I'll let you know if I can see them. They're coming on now. They're coming up. So I'll just change the view on that. Um, okay, are we all good? Perfect. Okay, thanks for that intro. Uh, so as Jane said, um, academic libraries across Scotland are collaborating on an open access uh, publishing platform that will be owned and managed by the participating libraries. Um, we are using the working title of Scottish Universities Open Access Press, um, but that is actually the subject of quite a heated debate at the moment. So do watch this space and expect um, a bit of change there. Um, today, I'll just go through the background to this project, covering what we've set out to achieve and why. And um, I'll look at how we've gone about um, our interpretation of setting up the platform where we've got to so far and what we've got planned next. So um, as James mentioned, this project has been coordinated um, by Scurll and my role is um, with Scurll as Executive Officer is, is based at the National Library of Scotland as well. So the, the Scurll network has existed for around 30 years in some format. So there's quite a strong um, background there in, support, in, in supporting each other, but also in developing a uh, cooperative uh, projects. So many people already uh, be familiar with Shadow, which is one of Scurll's biggest uh, projects, which has been around for about 12 uh, years now. So I guess we had the experience there through collaboration uh, from the Shadow Network. And I guess that just gave us the framework and the foundation to start thinking about other scope uh, for collaboration. So as with Shadow, this process began, the process towards developing the press began with the identification of a shared challenge. So in this case, we were looking at a clear and cost-effective route for open access publishing that would set, satisfy funder requirements. So very much keeping pace with all the recent policy developments um, in the area um, and, um, and, and looking to respond to that. Beyond meeting that immediate objective though, there is appetite um, within the group just to explore alternative um, approaches to academic publishing to look at projects that are of the academy and are absolutely focused on uh, the needs of the academy. So this um, gives us the scope to do that. I'm sorry, I seem to have um, picked up a, an issue with my slides moving on. Um, hopefully I'll be able to manage that. Um, so as I said, through Shadow, we already had that experience of working together and the confidence to look at and do other things. We know that at scale in Scotland, we're, we're a good size for, for working together in this way. So from that background um, came this appetite to, to move on and to look at how we can um, develop, develop the press. So it started with, uh, back in 2019, um, Scurll commissioned research um, to test proof of concept for a collaborative universities press. 
Um, the resulting report was very favourable towards that prospect and discussions moved on from there. Um, alas, the pandemic intervened, which meant that plans um, had to be refactored accordingly. So it's turning out that um, 2022 is the big year of action um, for the press. So that um, kind of explains why and uh, kind of why now. My slides have already taken the executive decision to move on to what, so I'll um, try and keep pace with them. Um, so in terms of what we're actually delivering, in, um, overall output, we're seeking to produce an online publishing platform where digital content is freely available uh, to all. As I say, we're using this working title of Scottish University's Open Access Press. Um, so in addition to the, uh, the, the, con the uh, electronic version, um, we're looking to provide an option for paid for uh, print on demand too. In terms of scope, um, the publishing will initially focus on monographs on any subject um, produced by academics at one of our 18 participating institutions. And there uh, they are. Um, we're focusing on monographs in this initial a two year phase, because we know that there is a strongest need there in terms of uh, approaches for publishing. We also know that we have to start small and then um, scale up to deliver within existing resources. So there is an intention to expand um, the scope of the project as the project develops. So we've already discussed looking at journals and perhaps e-textbooks as the press develops, but we just don't have the capacity to do everything at once. Um, so as I said, though, we will cover all uh, subject areas that receive submissions while being conscious that um, arts and humanities, social sciences are likely to be more interested in monograph uh, publishing. I think one of the big popular misconceptions or one of the big uh, kind of questions that, that was around, like our, as a Scottish university press, are we focusing on Scottish uh, themed or topic material? And that's absolutely not the case. We're looking to cover the breadth of uh, research coming out of Scottish institutions. Um, the press will operate on a not-for-profit basis. Um, our delivery model is to work through one of our partner institutions, the, the University of Edinburgh will, will uh, host the platform. And through that, we hope to really just to scope out what the true cost of publishing is. Um, we want to have a fully featured professional uh, publishing solution that will make authors want to come and work with us. Um, but this inevitably comes with a cost. So it can't be that we're doing all of this for free, but we are committed to finding the best possible uh, solution to cover costs. And we'll do that in consultation with our partner uh, institutions and in a way that's um, completely uh, transparent and through, um, through discussion. Um, so those partners then, um, 18 of them, ranging from the larger research intensive institutions right through to small specialist um, institutions. And we've also got the Open University in there too. Um, we recognise that the diversity, you know, it's great to have so many of the SCURL membership involved, um, but there are obviously some challenges about the diversity too. And certainly challenges with these slides for which I apologise. Um, we know that there will be considerable variation in the publishing needs and the publishing patterns of the different institutions. And we've been clear about that from inception. So we've developed an open and inclusive management structure so that all participants have an equal voice, a place around the table and an equal voice in decision making. Um, for this reason, our management board has one representative from each of the participating institutions. So that board was just formed at the end of last year, met for the first time in December, and um, they then met again just last week, actually. So it's still a very new group, uh, still finding its flow, but it will be responsible for the strategic direction of the press, and the members of that group will also be um, expected to make in-kind uh, contributions to the project. So through participation in work packages and working groups, where they have a specific expertise. The management board is chaired by Hannah Whaley, who's assistant director of uh, the library at the University of Dundee. And vice chair is Dominic Tate, who's head of um, research at the uh, University of Edinburgh Library. On the 1st of March, we were also delighted to welcome our first uh, 
full-time paid member of uh, staff uh, via Dominique Walker, who's joined us for two years on secondment from the University of uh, Glasgow. And as Jean mentioned as well, I've um, taken on the role of project uh, manager um, and I'm responsible for the central uh, coordination of efforts across that group. And I think after today, I will not be responsible for <laughs> the creation of slides uh, for the group. Um, so moving on to how um, we've, we've gone about this, as I've said, our approach is very much dependent on contributions from our, our members or from our, our network. So we're using the skills and expertise that already exist across the Skirrell network to drive uh, the project. So that's partly borne out of necessity um, since there isn't really an obvious route to support unless I've missed um, lots of funding opportunities uh, flying around out there and um, that, that that certainly was, didn't seem to be an option for us um, but this is as well as being born out of necessity there is a, a, an opportunity here there, there is um, a benefit to this and that because of the way we're working it mitigates the risk so no partner is contributing too much in terms of either resource or in terms of um, in, invest in money. So it means that we, we, we kind of are able just to experiment more freely. Um, it also allows us to keep things small and simple while having the option to scale up over uh, time. Um, crucially, as I've already mentioned, if we're keeping the activity within the network, it gives us that freedom to scope out um, this kind of big question about what it actually you know what the actual costs are and what's reasonable uh, cost for for digital publishing so it gives us a real opportunity to understand that and to have a uh, control over uh, some of those overheads um, in terms of uh, funding at the moment we have a two-year commitment from those participating institutions to contribute to the running costs we've tried to keep that as as, as low as possible so that means um, dedicated staff and hosting the platform the way we have managed this is that the governing body of Scuttle, the business committee, has set three bands and um, three contribution levels, which are linked uh, to the size of the institution. Um, participants are aware, though, that the overall journey towards establishing the press and, and getting the full set up is likely to be a five to ten year project. But we've been clear that member contributions are anticipated for at least um, the first five years of that. After that point, we'd hope to be in a position where the operating costs can be generated through the press activity rather from this uh, standalone contribution. So we're doing uh, that's kind of real, real focus right now. We're doing a lot of work to scope out um, the financial model. Um, so that that's all in place and out there for discussion before uh, the launch, um, which will be towards the end of the year in, the, in autumn. And as I've said, that whole process is supported through discussion and um, negotiation with our uh, management board. At the moment, um, we have moved on to forming an editorial board. Um, so we put the call out for that very recently. Um, that editorial board will be formed primarily of uh, academic colleagues. We were, we've actually been kind of blown away by the response to that call, actually. We kind of put it out there and, you know, as with any of these things, you're never uh, quite sure what will come back. And I've been saying to colleagues that I had visions of the nanny recruitment uh, scene from Mary Poppins, where um, the housekeeper opens the door and there's like just one person there. So I had kind of notions of that and, and horror visions of uh, no support, but it's been the exact opposite, actually. So we've had such a positive uh, response that we're going to move towards a more structured uh, recruitment process for our editorial board. In terms of how that um, board will be composed, we're looking to have um, a good coverage of disciplines. It will, in the first case, be a single editorial board covering all submissions. Um, we're conscious that as time goes on, that might be a, a decision we need to revisit and um, include uh, more specific boards. But for now, it'll be a single board looking to cover um, all disciplines and also looking for input from different types of institutions, just so that all of our members are um, are represented and um, looking as well to have good geographical uh, coverage. We've also discussed having a mechanism um, for supporting early career researchers to be involved in that and are quite interested in maybe mentoring to support that um, as well as you know being mindful of overall uh, overall diversity within the group. So really for us at the moment, it's about getting that balance right. It's about um, making sure the composition is right rather than setting an arbitrary number uh, for, for members while 
being conscious that we still need to keep that realistic so as not to become um, basically an unruly, an unruly bunch. Um, okay, so um, as I said before, this is the, the new platform is uh, due for launch in uh, autumn. So we're looking at a very busy few months ahead. Um, on this slide, there are some of the big kind of key milestones, uh, but within that, there are, kind of, there are several other work packages going on. I've already mentioned the, the scoping of the financial model as being one of uh, those. Um, we're also looking at laying the groundwork for the platform um, at the moment. Obviously, that's not just going to materialise over, over the summer. We're starting to scope that out at the moment. Um, one of the big pieces of work we've just completed is to develop a comms strategy. So we're conscious that we are a big group, 18 institutions with various, you know, stakeholder groups coming off with their, you know, different information needs. So we've set out a, a communication strategy, which hopes to, you know, support clear and consistent messaging throughout the project life and across all interested parties. Um, Related to that, we've been undertaking a partnership mapping activity to make sure that we connect up with all of the you know amazing work that's already going on around open access. So because of our kind of our collaborative uh, structure, we've been working really closely with White Rose Press and really grateful for all of the input from them. And I have to say as well that the JISC New Universities Publishing Toolkit was a very timely resource, which, we, which we've um, made very good use of. Um, so that's um, that really concludes where our plans have uh, got to, where we're at at the moment, and um, the, the key kind of features of where we're at. Um, I'm very happy to, um, really looking forward to taking part in discussions now, and I'm really uh, looking forward to those slides. Um, <laughs> stop moving by themselves. <laughs> <laughs> um, Brilliant. And... <laughs> Thank you, Gillian. Thank you. Thank you. Brilliant. Well done. <laughs> Naughty slides. Um, that, that was so thorough. I, I, it certainly answered every single question I had about the initiative, but I, I, I will remind everyone that to, to please, um, Mel, just put that in the chat. Please do share thoughts or questions in the chat and um, uh, join the discussion later by, by raising your hand. But thank you, Gillian. Thank you. Um, that was really thorough. Thank you. Okay, so we knew, now move on to our second speaker, who is Rebecca Wojtowska. Um, She's the Open Access Publishing Officer at the University of Edinburgh um, in the Scholarly Communications team. She's responsible for managing Edinburgh Diamond, which is an open access hosting service which offers an alternative publishing solution for staff and students who wish to publish their own books and journals. So Rebecca. Hi. Hi. I will just share my screen and hopefully it will that's Perfect. it i can see it coming up thank you lovely thank you um yep hi everyone i'm rebecca Wojcicki, um based on the scholarly communications team at the university of edinburgh and i'm the open access publishing officer so um what i am going to go through for you today is information about our open access hosting service. So I'm going to start by giving a little bit of background to the service. I'm going to let you know about our brand new book hosting service, which I'm very excited about. Um, I'm going to give some details about our recent rebrand um, and share our plans for the future as well. So just a little bit of background to start with. Um, we did launch a journal hosting service in 2009 and we used Open Journal Systems or OJS. Um, for those of you that don't know, OJS is open source software from the Public Knowledge Project, or PKP. Uh, there's a lot of acronyms, I apologise in advance. Um, we still do use OJS and we have a lot of in-house knowledge about this system. Uh, we are a hosting service, we're not a publisher, and as such we have no responsibility for peer review or production, etc. That is all on the editorial teams. Instead, uh, we focus on empowering and equipping academics and students with everything they need to run successful journals and launch successful books. So we focus mainly on hosting, technical support and providing publishing expertise. So the service is free of charge to staff and students of the University of Edinburgh, but we do actually provide a shared service to other Scottish institutions through SCURL um, for, for a very small fee, and that only serves to cover the costs. So we don't actually make any profit from that and all money is fed straight back into the service. Uh, we do have a service board and that is comprised of academics, students, journal editors, librarians and a representative from Edinburgh University Press as well. 
In terms of staffing, we have one full-time member of staff, and that is myself. Um, and we also get one day a week of tech support. So now on to the book hosting service itself. So the service was very much led by academic demand. Um, we did have academics uh, publishing books and content on um, you know, sites like WordPress, etc. And they're not fully integrated with publishing workflows or existing metadata systems. So we really wanted something that could ensure this amazing research just didn't fall through the cracks. Um, and instead was hosted somewhere that could be integrated with, you know, Crossref, the directory of open access books, et cetera. Um, we also saw launching the book hosting service as another step in the university's commitment to investing in open access research in general. And of course, there is a rising cost of e-textbooks. Um, and we really like the idea as well that academics can tailor textbooks to their own courses and at no cost to the students. Um, also, research is becoming increasingly more online based, um, so we're kind of accommodating that. But it is worth noting, of course, that print does still have a lot of value, um, especially in areas that have digital poverty issues. So um, as we use OJS to host our journals, we did look around, but we did very quickly decide to use Open Monograph Press or OMP. Um, which is also open source software from PKP. So this basically meant that we could ensure that our branding was consistent between the two platforms and that any users of OJS would intuitively be able to use and navigate OMP. Um, we had also installed OMP for a, um, an external partner in the past, so we were vaguely familiar with it anyway. Uh, we created the framework using the existing one that we had in place for our journals. Uh, so pulling together all that guidance was actually relatively easy for us. Uh, so what does the service actually offer? Uh, we offer all of the following free of charge. So use of the book hosting platform, as well as ongoing technical support, preservation of content and upgrades. We offer training, documentation, advice and policies, um, all to ensure books are in line with industry standards. We also offer the initial setup of pretty much everything uh, with some limited customization. Uh, we dish out ISBNs. Um, these are, as I'm sure you know, quite expensive to purchase individually. So we just get them in bulk from Nielsen. Uh, we also deal with chapter DOIs, cross-ref submissions and metadata delivery. We provide indexing support, including finding and submitting to all the relevant databases. Um, and I think since uh, 2020, we've increased discoverability through indexing by 1,118%. So we've, we've made a lot of effort in that area recently. Um, finally, we provide annual reports that help measure the book's success. Um, but yeah, basically, we just do all the background publishing stuff that no one really likes to think about, but which is crucial to dissemination and discoverability. Um, and it is what we were already offering the journals, but, you know, ISSNs instead of ISBNs. So we just kind of tweaked the, the offering a little bit to match the books a bit more. So everything is fully Diamond Open Access. We use Creative Commons licenses and we don't ask for book processing charges. So we're keeping it open both ways. You don't pay to be published and you don't pay to access the content. Um, and this accessibility of Diamond Open Access is a core component of inclusive publishing for us. So I've just included some pictures of two books, uh, one that we launched with and one that is in the works. So Anatomy is an illustrated textbook guide to the art of anatomy for medical students. I love a good pun, so I like that title. Um, the students actually illustrated anatomy on real human bodies, as you can see in the pictures. So it's actually pretty cool um, and it's, it's quite a unique book. And then the book that we launched with is Fundamentals of Music Theory, and that's a collaborative e-textbook project by staff and students of both the Reed School of Music and the university's Open Educational Resource Service. So, um, yeah, it's a fantastic book. And I'm hoping this just gives an idea of the kind of um, books that we're going to be hosting, different subject areas, different types of books. And we do have some more in the in the pipeline as well. I also mentioned that we recently rebranded. Uh, we thought it would make sense to bring our service offerings under one name and that just helps with promotion and it also saves me from having to say journal hosting service and book hosting service all the time uh, so welcome to edinburgh diamond uh, you can see our new branding here including the logo and the website banners um, all in the university colors and we will be using the university logos on all materials as well as our new unlocked diamond logo um, we chose the name edinburgh diamond literally because it's, it does what it says on the tin, it promotes diamond open access, uh, promotes transparency and promotes high quality. It's also what differentiates us uh, from Edinburgh University Press as well. 
So we launched both the book host and service and the rebrand at the same time. And that was during open access week last year. So I thought I'd discuss the roadblocks of launching the new service in, in a little bit of detail. So firstly, our timeline was much longer than anticipated um, as we hadn't expected so many technological setbacks that were outside of our control. Um, you are of course reliant on many other teams who are all mega, mega busy. Another core roadblock to overcome was and is incentivizing academics to use a hosting service um, instead of a, tradi a traditional publisher. Um, it's not something we've really struggled with, to be honest, but um, we are transparent about the pros and cons of each. And we find that our job isn't so much to convince people that our route is the best, but more to provide a brilliant service that would really benefit those who need it. Um, of course, we have the same issue with battling old perceptions of um, open access content as somehow lower quality. And we combat that through implementing industry standard policies, including publication ethics guided by COPE and peer review policies, among other things. And we also aim to get our journals and books indexed in prestigious databases, um, you know, such as the DOAJ, the DOAB, as well as uh, Scopus on the Web of Science, just to name a few. Uh, promoting the service was slightly easier than it could have been, purely because we had the same networks in place because of the journals. Um, so I emailed journal editors just to see if they had any projects. I've been liaising with academic support librarians who are still in the process of recommending the service uh, to their contacts at the relevant schools. Um, and indeed, we have already got one book from, from these connections. Um, the scholarly communication team uh, already offers ISBNs to academics. So we realized that was an opportunity to promote the service to requesters. So just in case they need a hosting solution. And we've had, we've had some interest that way as well, which has been great. Uh, we have a new set of web pages and they reflect the service and the new brand. And we try to link to it from any university web pages that um, have anything to do with open access, open research, or publishing. Um, and finally, we use and will continue to use good old fashioned word of mouth. So I shout about it to everyone I meet and talk about it in pretty much every presentation, including this one. So um, I just thought I'd include a little bit of feedback from the, the book service users. Um, I just wanted to ask them why they chose our service and what they thought of the system. So I won't read them all out because I'm limited time and everything, but comments ranged from thinking the service would be convenient and valuable to um, respecting the university's step um, in, in our commitment to open access and making the world a better place. So um, I, I love that comment personally. Don't we all want to make the world a better place? Um, so one user noted the service felt timely in the face of rising book costs and the pandemic. And they also said the service will benefit the university by reducing textbook costs, uh, benefit staff by providing access to easily customizable open textbooks, and benefit students by providing uh, free high quality digital learning materials. Um, finally, a user commented that a downside is having to generate all the different formats manually, such as PDF, HTML, EPUB, etc. Uh, we don't offer that as part of our service at the moment, not for books or journals, just because of a limited resource. So um, that is a, a fair comment. So I wanted to look to the future quickly. Um, we will continue to develop service strategies and policies just to ensure we're always compliant with industry standards as well as funding legislation. Um, we aim to promote and grow the service so more people are aware of the research they can access freely or the service um, that they can benefit from. Uh, I did mention indexing, so we'll be working on that and we'll be seeking further opportunities for involvement in teaching and learning so that the service, as it grows, becomes tailored to academic and student requirements. Um, and finally, we will, we will just be gathering more feedback, again, to grow the service according to user need. So by way of concluding, I would say that OMP is intuitive and particularly useful if you use OJS already. Uh, don't feel the need to launch with a huge portfolio, just one or two key titles will be enough to draw people in. Uh, be clear about your mission and strategy, like why you launch in the service, who will benefit. Uh, this is obviously important because uh, running such a service requires funding, obviously, and you need to be able to demonstrate its importance to staff and students. Uh, talk to your fellow librarians, academics, researchers and students. Again, this is to ensure that you're not being overly prescri prescriptive with your service. Um, and instead you're ensuring that it is molded by requirements and demands. Um, I would also say you're going to need people with publishing and tech expertise working on the service, as journal and book editors often require guidance when it comes to things like uh, publication ethics, publishing best practice, indexing, 
workflow management, just to name a few. Um, the tech expertise is a given, considering your service will require someone to develop and maintain an OMP installation, the server upgrades, all things like that. Um, this is, in my opinion, what's needed to make a service like this a success, um, just to ensure that your users are really fully supported. And then that in turn um, incent incentivizes them to stick with Diamond Open Access. So finally, plan way, 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 way in advance. Um, setting up a new service takes time and there will likely be technological setbacks. So it actually took us well over a year just to get everything as we wanted it before, um, before launching the service. So um, yeah, just remember, it's better to launch with a, a finalized high quality product than to rush something out. Um, although that applies to everything in life, I think so. Uh, thank you very much for listening. And if anyone has any questions, just let me know. And do follow us at Edin Diamond. Thank you, Rebecca. That was brilliant. It, equally, just get on with it. But underpinned by really good strategy um, uh, and planning. A bit thank of planning. you. Thank you so much. Um, OK, so we will take questions at the end, as I've already said. Um, but we're now going to move on to our third presentation. Uh, this is from Suzanne and Bethany, University of Sussex. Bethany Logan is the Research and Scholarship Librarian at the University of Sussex, managing a, um, a new project to build an institutional open publishing service. Um, Suzanne Tatham is an Associate Director at the University, leading on library strategy for open research. Suzanne and Beth. I think I've shared my screen. Can you see that, Jane? Yeah. All good, yeah. Oh, good. Thanks, Beth. So I'm going to kick off and then Beth's going to um, uh, uh, take over halfway through. Um, so just a, a few thoughts, really, about the approach that we're taking at Sussex. I think, as you know, the previous speakers have highlighted, um, libraries have got an important role to play in helping to shift institutional culture around open publishing. Um, and I feel like there are lots of things that we have to do around open publication, which are about compliance, but actually where we really want to focus our energies is in looking for ways to develop the infrastructure for open publication. Um, at Sussex, we don't have institutional structures in place, such as a university press, and we're not a large university, um, but we're developing an approach which we hope will be successful and sustainable. So we're experimenting at the moment um, and we feel that this is giving us an opportunity to build knowledge and develop an evidence base to hopefully leverage institutional support, but also enthusiasm for this. Um, we've already supported some institutional open publications, such as this book by the Active Learning Network using the Fulcrum platform and also a Sussex Humanities Lab publication. Um, these have been very helpful for us in terms of developing our knowledge and our experience. Um, so in the absence of a university mandate um, for us to develop the service, um, we've sought strategic level buy-in from the university's education committee. And we've also engaged with the university's leads for our education and scholarship career pathways. And we feel that supporting um, open scholarship aligns well with the university's aims to raise the profile of academics on these career pathways. And strategically, this approach also fits with our longer term aim to redirect budget away from pay to access to pay to publish. And we're starting to look at our acquisition budget in a different way. So actively looking for ways to support open infrastructure beyond journals and transformative agreements to all types of research and scholarship outputs. So we're making an investment here, but we can see potential benefits. I feel like the, the long-term health of open publishing ecosystem relies on diversification. And as libraries, as well as supporting alternative models, we can help to broaden the landscape and the conversation. And also that open has just as much value for education students as it does for research. So there are definitely reputational benefits to be gained for institutional publishing for the individual and the institution in terms of potential reach, citations, potential impact, and also recognition from textbook adoption by other universities. There's also the issue of value and suitability. I feel that current models um, for access to content are not flexible enough and tend not to offer good value for money. And at the extreme end of this, we find ourselves buying back Sussex generated content year on year. 
So inspired by NUI Galway's Libraries Open Press, we set about lining up the requisite parts and players at Sussex, and this included a subscription to the Pressbooks publishing platform. We gave ourselves a year to develop our open publishing capability to identify structural requirements and explore the library's role within the publication process. Our intention from the start has been to build internal capacity and capability to harness existing expertise and to expand skill sets. We work closely with an academic in the School of Psychology to capture requirements and we've established a project team within the library. We've also secured the services of a scientific illustrator and have sought commitment from both internal and external authors for chapter contributions and editing and reviewing work. We're aware that our approach carries risk. Um, obviously we're aiming for success, but from the outset, we've acknowledged that the project may fail, but that what we learn from the experience will have value. It's been an opportunity for us to explore a different type of e-textbook publication. So rather than publishing a finished project, a finished, uh, finished product, um, we'll build it incrementally, adding new sections each year. I'm gonna hand over to Beth now some more detail about that. Thank you, Suzanne. Um, yeah, so I want to talk about some of the practical aspects of this project. And uh, for this pilot, we also drew on DISC's new University Press Toolkit. It was enormously helpful as our starting point, and particularly the sections around production, as this is where our skills really needed the most development. Um, so we took that toolkit and we adapted it for our own context, building in flexibility as we went along. Um, one thing that was particularly interesting, the university's contracts team were not keen on the idea of issuing contracts to Sussex authors because they already have a contract with the university. Um, but they did suggest that we ask our external authors to sign contracts. And immediately this kind of uneven approach just didn't feel in keeping with the ethos of the project. So instead of going down that route, we've just decided to be really transparent with our plans and our schedules to talk to our authors about their commitments um, and the potential benefits of the project right from the start. We worked really closely with our colleague Catherine Hall in psychology, so it was her initial idea um, to create this book. And so in her role, she retains academic oversight and editorial control of the content, while um, the project team in the library picks up the administrative and the organisational burden. And really quickly, it became clear that there was a bit of a blurry line between these two roles. So, for example, making decisions around including pedagogical devices, so um, learning objectives at chapter level or um, boxes that spotlight key terminology. That sort of sits somewhere between academic oversight and production admin. Um, and it really wasn't something that I'd thought about right at the start of the project. So we needed to develop a style guide in collaboration with our academics. Working with an illustrator is also something that's new to us in the library, um, but our authors did have experiences to draw on, and often this was where they had experiences working with slightly better resource publishers, so expectations um, were a little bit um, different. Um, and at the moment we're in the process of finalising the illustration requirements from our authors, and I can see just from what's been submitted, I know we're going to have to be really careful in balancing expectations while also ensuring that we get a really high quality product that has consistent design throughout. In contrast, our authors' experiences of peer review processes have been enormously enlightening. Um, they're really keen to help us develop an approach that gives early career researchers opportunities and, and this is really important, really honours um, the review contributions of these colleagues. And so at the moment, we are looking at a spring term publication date with a view that this title will be used in psychology teaching for first and second years straight away. So is it working? Um, there have been a number of challenges along the way, but each of them has also been uh, an opportunity to reflect on what it is we're actually trying to do. There has been a lot of learning on the job. Um, there were things that we were really confident about, you know, our existing librarian knowledge of copyright and licensing, metadata delivery, but actually we find ourselves spending more and more time on testing the Pressbook functionality and uh, 
things like organizing graphs and tables. We weren't really expecting to need to do that, but it's it of course important. Um, some delays from our authors um, and some changes to the illustration requirements have also been a bit of a challenge. Um, this has meant that our project plan has already been revised a fair bit. Um, so it is extremely agile. Um, but on the one hand, um, while we do have some slightly unresponsive authors to contend with, we're also finding that word is spreading within the Sussex community. Uh, researchers from other disciplines are approaching us to talk about additional projects that they've got going on. And I think this is it's really exciting and it's a testament to the value of the pilot uh, and I think to the good relationship that we have with our academic community. But it's also a challenge. Um, helping researchers is what we love to do, um, but we haven't been able to say yes to all of these projects, partly because of resources, but also because our experimental approach isn't going to be the right fit for everyone just yet. Um, so while we haven't had the chance to get into some of the practical details around peer review just yet, having the chance to take a good look at the process has been really interesting. And we're looking at exploring how we can engage with students with this, um, which is something that I'm really excited about. We're particularly keen to get that input around additional features such as quizzes and kind of interactive elements to the textbook. And lastly, yes, the timetable is certainly ambitious and some days we feel more confident about it than others, but the iterative process um, really gives us flexibility. So our chapters are ranked in order of priority um, based on when they're going to be needed in the term for teaching. So this is really beneficial for authors because it means that they don't feel that we're constantly bombarding them with nudges about submission dates. But it also helps the project team because we can chop up the workload into, into different chunks. So thinking about what's next for us and actually just hearing um, from the others on the panel has already got um, all of the cogs going. Um, but this is a really exciting time for us. Um, we do have a few different projects on the horizon. And it's really hard to resist these opportunities, but we definitely need to learn to walk before we can dance. Um, so in addition to our psychology book, we are working with authors from the Active Learning Network, which is a cross-institutional collection of um, researchers. As Suzanne said, we published some of their titles before on the Fulcrum platform. So moving these over from Fulcrum to Pressbook gave us a nice opportunity to do a bit of stress testing. Um, and at the moment, they're just finalising a project called 100 Ideas in Active Learning. And for this project, we're taking a very different approach. So instead of us managing all of the administrative side of it, we're giving them direct access to the platform, um, which is going to be much less hands-on for us. Um, so it's a different kind of experiment with a whole host of different challenges. And they are hoping to publish that in April, which is very soon, I've just realised. <laughs> um, as these projects come to an end, one thing we're really keen to do is to examine our processes. So as Suzanne said at the start, we know that things may go wrong. Failing, but, but failing fast has really huge value as we will learn so much. And so whether we succeed or fail, or most likely something in between, um, I think our evaluation is going to be coupled with author consultation and a bit of journey mapping. Um, which will go on to form the basis of a service design if or when um, we look to scale up and establish our library press in whatever form that may take. Thank you. Thank you, Beth. That was really, that was great. And I love, I love the idea of, um, uh, of learning on the job. Uh, that developing our developing um, our staff and our existing staff to, to work in these new areas. Um, I think we all know that it's you know recruitment is difficult at the moment, and actually developing working with our staff to learn these new skills is 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 great. Thank you, thank you both. Okay, so we're now moving on to questions. So if everyone would like to turn their cameras on. Um, Okay, I know there's a question here. There's a question in chat from Stuart Dempster, uh, which I think is for 
Gillian rather than Rebecca. So, um, and it's a question that was on uh, uh, that I've I, I had thought about, um, which is about non-scale universities um, being able to utilise the service in the future. I think we're all a little bit jealous of Scotland and and wealth, but the fact that you can work together in so many diverse institutions c- can can work together. Um, uh, so, yeah. Are you able to answer that, Gillian? Have you even thought yeah. about it? Um, so we, we have already been asked about that and have um, thought about that. I think at the moment we feel like 18 institutions is like a, a big enough uh, task. So we, we are focused on making it work for uh, those Scuttle member institutions at the moment. And I would think that, you know, just given what we've got planned over the next um, five years or so, that that would be enough of a task. But beyond that, we're certainly open um, to, to expanding further. So we've not set any limits. We'd love to be able to do that, but have to be realistic about what we can um, successfully deliver within the resources we have at the moment. Have you, so just a little follow-up question for me. Have you had any discussions since this, this girl? Uh, and, and I wonder how that fits and, and interacts with the individual initiatives that are going on within the universities. Yeah, so we um, have had a lot of discussion around that, particularly obviously because um, one of uh, their key, our key delivery uh, partner um, is Edinburgh University and obviously Edinburgh uh, University Press is uh, um, very active as well. So we, we've got kind of dialogue going, but I think what we're trying to achieve is different we're working in in very different ways so there's we would see those things as existing as part of the bigger ecosystem um, and that there's scope for for both to exist and meet uh, distinct needs okay thank you i wonder if i could persuade kate price to come in and ask her question um uh, on the round table but in the meantime um suzanne and suzanne and beth why why did we move from fulcrum to press Brooks. Have you got an answer to that? <laughs> we might have slightly different answers, actually. <laughs> Do you want to go first, Suzanne, then? Uh, so mine's about money. <laughs> this, will <be> more, <laughs> this will be more interesting. <laughs> so with Fulcrum, you've got, um, you know, you've got a cost per publication. With Pressbooks, obviously, we've taken out um, a subscription, but we can do any number of um, publications within that. Obviously, factoring in staff resource, which does cost something, and academic time which so there are costs but it's not I mean, there's not an APC basically but Beth you'll have more interesting ones than that. Oh mine's just about DOIs um uh, <laughs> well at the point at which we did it um we weren't it was such a lovely platform to use for because it was really easy um we couldn't get chapter level DOIs and I think the amount of importance that we put in that when we talk to researchers about being able to share their work it made it really difficult when they're like okay so where are our DOIs mm. and then it's, I believe it's in their roadmap, but um, it hasn't come to light yet. So, um, okay. Thank you. Thanks, Beth. And thank you, Kate. <laughs> Do you want to ask your question? Thank you for that, Jay. I'm um, sorry. <laughs> I think you've already started actually um, just articulating some of this, but I'm quite interested to know about the relationship between um, Edinburgh Diamond and Edinburgh University Press and how the um, the levels of staffing maybe communicate um, how you've um, kind of strategically placed those two different areas and also how that works in the academics minds as well. Yeah, of course. So um, the remits of the two kind of services are very different. Edinburgh University Press, um, I actually used to work there before I moved over to the library. Um, Edinburgh University Press are a traditional publisher and they support, um, well, anyone can submit to EUP and go through their rigorous, you know, peer review process. Um, Edinburgh Diamond was set up very much to support the staff and students of Edinburgh University. And also um, we don't have kind of rigorous peer review. If you want us to host your content, we'll just do a quick check, make sure it's not, you know, offensive or contravenes any um, characteristics protected by law but you know other than that you know we will support all academics and all students regardless of the subject matter um it it also means that we might catch things that might not be commercially viable they might not be profitable and therefore might not be taken on um by either commercial publishers or other presses um so the remits and target audiences I think or target users of, of each are very different um and as I mentioned we do have a representative of EUP on the board so um we do we like to think we work closely with them just so that they're always aware of our activities and 
we're all, they do a lot of open access stuff as well. But the reason we rebranded to Edinburgh Diamond was because Diamond is what sets us out as different. That is one thing we offer that that EUP don't. Well, that's the only thing we offer. Um, <laughs> so, um, yeah, I hope that clarifies it a little bit for you. Thank you, Rebecca. And thank you, Kate. And there's a load of good questions coming in. As, as, as I'm going to remind you, raise your hand and we'll bring you in. Um, OK, uh, Janet Alcock, uh, great question. Any thoughts on how you might include and reach out to early career researchers and support them with their first monograph publication? So um, any of you want to answer that? Gillian, Rebecca, Beth, Suzanne? Yeah, I can um, start off on that. So we've, um, through the editorial board, already started thinking about how we might include early careers researchers there. Um, and, you know, that kind of part of an ongoing process to make sure that, that they're involved. But in terms of how we would uh, look at uh, publishing, so at the moment we are um, still scoping out our model, but we have had discussions about whether we would make opportunities to in encourage particular uh, publications from particular groups to come through so we're really just at too early a stage to have anything solid on that but it is forming part of our thoughts and discussions through the management board. Rebecca? Yeah so I do a little bit of outreach um the University of Edinburgh we have uh, library bite size um, sessions where students early career researchers can come along and find out about a topic so I present on kind of publishing your first journal article or kind of how to uh, work on a mon monograph mining your thesis, basically. Um, so we do a little bit of outreach. We are still in the early stages of promoting our book service. So um, maybe Gillian and I can put our heads together <laughs> and come up with a few strategies for that. But, um, but yeah, at the minute, it's just a little bit of outreach. Beth, Suzanne. I was just going to come in. I, I, this is a little bit broader than the early career researcher, but it was what I referred to earlier in terms of um, at the University of Sussex, we've got this um, education and scholarship pathway. So it's for academics who are focused on teaching, but they have a scholarship part of what they do as well. So for us, it's, it's particularly keen to reach out to that group um, at, at, at the moment, because like I said, I think, um, you know, producing, you know, textbooks or other types of materials that teaching but on an open platform is a, a really it's really supportive of the work that they're trying to do with the scholarship part of their career pathway so that's the that's that particular group of people who we're, who we're, we're reaching out mm -hmm. to at the moment because we see a lot of value there for them I was just going to add that I think it's been really interesting in the last few years the number of ECRs that are coming to us and talking about open access monograph publication it's it's, it's been a real shift um, and I alluded in my presentation, I alluded to not being able to take on all presentations uh, of all um, projects rather. And we have been approached by a couple of ECRs, which is brilliant. But and not to um, say anything bad about our um, pilot project, but for some people, if that's going to be your first monograph, um, our, our service isn't quite going to do um, it justice for some people at the moment. Mm. So I have turned a few people away because of that and then pointed them towards, you know, there are so many great other open access publishers out there as well. So it's not just that we want to grab everybody that we have at Sussex uh, and pull them into our service. It's also about making sure that ECRs know about the broader landscape as well. Yeah, of course. Um, a, a sort of a clarification from Stuart Dems to Rebecca, you may have seen this. Um, so uh, did you say that Diamond offered a service to skill members for a modest fee? And if they do, might this be extended to non skill members in the future? Yes. Yeah, so we do actually currently have an external partners program that runs alongside um, the skill one. Um, skill partners do get a 20 percent discount. On, on the fee, I think it's around, because um, we're very transparent about everything, it's around 1600 for external partners per year. And that includes um, onboarding, migrations, kind of setting everything up and ongoing support. Um, we have one external partner at the minute, and that is the um, Journal of European Health Libraries, I do believe. Um, so what we do ask if people would like to chat to us about becoming an external partner, um, we do ask for journals that are themed some way to libraries or open access or Scotland just because with our resource uh, staffing and otherwise being quite low at the minute we mm. we can't take on too much um, we are hoping to grow in the future but for now those are the kind of um, 
prerequisites we have for our external partners program. Okay, um, Rebecca, while I've got you, go, I was going to ask you a question about branding. Um, so, so uh, did you? Did, did, it's, it's, it's a challenge to brand and, and can take a lot of resources. How, how did you go about it? Did you use your, did you have support from the institution to create that brand? So we had support um, to go ahead with the rebrand mm -hmm. and launch it. Um, I actually designed the logo myself. I did it on Photoshop because <laughs> 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 we all know budgets are tight. So, yeah. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> And um, my colleague came up with the name. So together we we kind of rebranded it ourselves, but we had the, the go ahead from senior management on that. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Thank you. Um, okay. So the metadata question, um, managing identities from Jane Kelly, uh, managing identifying metadata for ebook publications on smaller OA platforms is a, is a challenge. Um, as we all know, how are panelists dealing with providing mark records for their OA books? Should I start with you, Gillian? Yeah, so again, we're not at that, we're not at the mm. stage yet where we're approaching that practically, but that'll actually be something that is provided uh, through our our partner in Edinburgh. So it's maybe better to move over to Rebecca on that one. Rebecca? Yeah, so this is something that we're starting to encounter now, but we're starting to get books. Um, OMP is great, but it isn't actually currently, it doesn't have metadata exports for anything other than Onyx. And I think it's Onyx 3.0. So we can't actually export metadata in the formats that we would like at the moment, such as Crossref, um, Mark and, and otherwise. So we are looking at, um, there's an open, open source program called Thoth that we're currently looking at where you input your book metadata and then you can export it in lots of different formats. So, um, yeah, that's kind of where we're at at the minute, where we're trying to find a solution to. <laughs> so I don't have an answer at the moment, I'm afraid. Beth? Uh, we're even earlier in the process. So um, <laughs> it, it's it's a note on a spreadsheet. Um, mm. We've had some conversations about it. Um, and I think we'll definitely be reaching out to the, the, the list community. When we advertised... Um, this part, well, obviously we have a part-time project post uh, working on this and we advertised it on Twitter. There was so much response from the mm. community and lots of people getting in touch to say, well, if you need a hand with metadata, come and talk to us about this. And so um, I will be taking advantage of those generous offers. Your fellow community practice coming up. Look, James has joined us. I, I took the hint. <laughs> Get on screen and ask your question. Yeah. <laughs> It, it, it's a fairly straightforward question. I was interested, Rebecca, I think you said, you know, you kind of developed a, a polished product and then put it out there. And the Sussex approach was an agile, you know, get it out there and keep iterating. And I was just interested as to why you both chose your respective approaches and, and you know, what's worked and what hasn't about the different ways of going about it. Because I think certainly from my sense, the, the Edinburgh approach is the more traditional library one and agile is is a newer thing for libraries. Rebecca? Yeah, so I think this partially comes because obviously I kind of manage the service and then I get support. Um, I'm a bit of a perfectionist, so it's probably a, a personality thing. But one thing I did like about it is that I could get everything in place before launching, such as policies and so and guidance and inclusion criteria, so that when I start getting um, you know queries, I have the answers. Um, which is good. Um, as I did say in my presentation, though, I did leave some things because I want it to be molded by user need. And that's probably one better thing about the agile method compared compared to mine. Um, and I was going to say something else and it has completely. <laughs> oh, the other thing, of course, is I needed at least one book to launch with. I, okay. <laughs> I, did, I didn't want to launch with with no books at all. So um, but I also didn't want to keep delaying it as well so that's how that's how the timing worked out for us anyway Suzanne um yeah so a couple of thoughts um I think one is it's it, it it um the approach that we've taken suits the way that we work so that was interesting what you were saying Rebecca about maybe how you direct things according to what suits your personality so I think we've definitely we've definitely done that for better or worse but also working with the um the psychology academic they were really keen to have a, a publication which could easily be added to and revised and new sections put in year on year. So I suppose it's much more 
um, it's much more the sort of OER approach, I suppose, rather than that, you know, launch of a final product. I mean, what we're intending is that at the end of the year, there will be something which looks like an online book, <laughs> um, but with a view to um, adding a whole extra chapter, which I suppose traditionally might have been like volume one, volume two, but it, it would just be um, adding to that, removing things, changing things so that they have a resource that they can work with in their in their teaching. So I think it, it suits that approach, but it might be for future publications. We will we will take a different approach because that won't always be needed. OK, um, thank you, James. Nikki. Just remembering to unmute. Yeah, yeah right. <laughs> nice to see you. Yeah. So um, I was just wondering, um, because Rebecca was talking about inclusion criteria, are there any types of books that are out of scope for any of your initiatives? And what made me think of this is I come from a very traditional STEM background. Um, and when I first got involved in the REF, I was really surprised to see that people could submit creative writing as a research output. So did have you factored this into your planning at all? Or has anyone asked if they could, they could publish fiction? Shall we start with Gillian? Thank you, Nikki. Hi, Nikki. Thanks for that. Um, no, we've not had um, requests about fiction specifically, but we're kind of conscious that obviously one of the things that we've got on the Scurril Network is a really diverse range of um, institutions. So mm. we've had a lot of questions from um, the Glasgow School of Art in particular about what we can support in terms of um, non-traditional types of uh, monograph. Um, we have scoped that out and are, are really committed to producing anything that, that, that's possible. I think where we might um, run into issues are around if we're offering a print on demand option and things like that. So we're scoping all that, but our intention is absolutely to be able to publish as widely as we possibly can according to the needs of um, participating institutions. Thank you, Julian. Rebecca? Um, yeah, so we're not putting um, any kind of limitations on that. So one of the first journals we launched is a community journal that isn't peer reviewed or anything. They don't desire to be indexed. Um, they publish poetry, among other things. So um, we do already host that content. And the next book we'll be publishing, hopefully this or next week, is called um, Food Without a Cooker. And it's a cookbook for people to be able to actually, uh, well, make food without having to use a cooker. And it's for people who perhaps homeless or don't have the means um, or access to to certain um, kitchen appliances so um, yeah we're gonna we're gonna be very open to see what what's coming in and we do want to use it to, to you know publish things that are of social value as well as academic value so that's very much our position on it. Thanks Rebecca. Beth? I was going to say, I think for us, we'll need to see where we're at at the end of this pilot when we're looking at developing a service. As Suzanne said, this, we're looking at supporting teaching materials kind of primarily. Um, and so haven't had, uh, yeah, haven't been asked about poetry or um, creative writing, but we have had um, queries about um, case studies for the business school, which is really exciting. And if we can get an in there, um, that's a whole world of very expensive textbooks that we'd love to replace. Um, and also some interesting kind of new approaches to publishing through teaching, whereby maybe the students are actively engaging with the platform and then they're publishing their uh, work to be examined in the form of a monograph, a collaborative monograph. So that would be very exciting, um, but that's, you know, post pilot. Thanks, Beth. Thanks, Nikki. Um, that picks up on, there's a comment there actually from Stuart Dempster about, about business and flipping the more expensive textbooks. Um, I wonder if, whilst we're on textbooks, I wonder if I could ask uh, a question that's, that's on there from um, Kara McCaffrey, which is around, have, has the panellists, this is about textbooks really, so for those of you doing monographs, um, has anyone encountered concerns from academics around loss of royalties from traditional textbook publishing? Suzanne, I wonder if I could go to you. Um, I think so far, the, the, I suppose in, in some ways, for obvious reasons, the people who have approached us are the people for whom that isn't an issue. But I know from conversations that we've had with some of our directors for teaching and learning, particularly some who have, um, I suppose, unusual academics and that they have money making textbooks, that's got quite a different question for them. And I think the chance is probably for them to switch to an institutional platform. They're 
less likely to do that, but they're a tiny minority, really, of ac academics, certainly at, at Sussex. I, th I think that, for, for, you know, most academics don't feel um, textbooks are, um, are money-making for them and are therefore quite interested in the approach that we're, that we're taking. Thanks, Suzanne. Anybody else want to come in on that? Um, yeah, I just wanted to, well, yeah, agree, because I think royalties are so low because the print runs are so low for um, textbooks and, well, mainly monographs. But yeah, I think a lot of academics, as far as I'm aware, do tend to donate them back to the, like, for example, to university presses anyway. So um, I've not heard anything from that. But in terms of journals, it's definitely more of an issue, I think, because um Obviously, journal royalties would usually go towards copy editing costs and things like that. And because our service doesn't provide that and it's diamond open access, that's definitely a gap that a lot of the journal editors do notice. So they have to look at funding from colleges and schools. So it's more admin um, in that sense. So um, I don't so much have a point as like <laughs> as a, just an observation of, of what I've been approached about. Yeah. OK, thanks. Rebecca, I've got a question here for you from Masood. Um, uh, uh, are there any plans, concerns about sustainability of Edinburgh Diamond based on potential exponential growth? Yeah, so um, the university recently invested in Edinburgh Diamond by bringing on a full time member of staff mm -hmm. um, who was my predecessor, who is now me, obviously. Um, and there is a commitment to investing in open access. And I think as long as the service is valuable and well used um, and we can demonstrate that, then I, I wouldn't worry about the sustainability. But maybe growth, I think you're right, that could be an area where we might struggle. Um, we might at one point have to put a cap on the amount of books or the amount of journals we can host unless we can get more staffing and resource. So um, I think it'll be um, a situation where we're just keeping an eye on it and ensuring we're not overburdening ourselves and growing at a, a rate that's sustainable. Thanks, Rebecca. Um, I can't see any more. There are there's lots of there's lots of chat in the chat. I can't see any more questions. If anyone feels that I've missed their question, could you pop it in again? Um, I have got a final one from me, which is about RLUK, really. Um, so uh, we're all talking about either creating our own infrastructure using open source. Um, uh, or using open source or 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 or, or, or other infrastructure. Um, I just wondered if uh, if there's anything you think RLUK could do to help, or funders could do to to help with this, because we're all ploughing our own little furrows, and and that's great because we need to turn that dial. But um, is there anything you think RLUK could do to help? I'll give you time to give it a bit of thought. Anybody want to come in, Rebecca? I wonder if some kind of like library publishing working group or something might be useful because even just this panel, um, I've mm. learned so much about these other mm. initiatives and it's making me think, oh, what can I apply to mine? And um, yeah. I love conferences like this for that reason. So maybe something that focuses on library publishing um, that RL UK could facilitate. I think that would be useful. Thank you, Rebecca. Anybody else? Suzanne? Um, yeah. I, I, yeah, this is going to sound like I'm volunteering to do lots more work. <laughs> <laughs> I think case studies are really helpful. They don't have to be long ones, but I just think, um, like you say, sometimes you have to wait for some, a conference like this to hear about some of the really interesting stuff that's happening. Mm. And sometimes I feel that, again, it, it, it's, it's that thing about us not wanting to share something until we've got like a perfect and finished result. And actually, I think case studies where you're sharing things that maybe we're just starting on or that you're in the middle of, um, are really useful and I think particularly for some institutions that maybe are a bit smaller or perhaps a bit less research intensive who sort of are, are really sort of um, feeling their way with this I think seeing what other people are doing and maybe seeing what other similar institutions are doing is quite helpful for them thinking about actually is that something that given the staffing and the resource that we've got that we could do as well so I think case studies but that aren't like big polished things that are almost just like something a little bit more blog post a work in progress yeah okay anything Beth J Gillian yeah no I, I just agree with, with both of those and um, thinking the idea of a network or bringing people mm -hmm. together and um, as Rebecca mentions a, a really good one and um, I, I was just thinking in terms of like that 
in te- when you start out, how daunting that can be, and how difficult it, you know the, the the risk aversion can be to manage. I think I noticed that flashing up in one of the comments mm-hmm. um, that, that yes. came through there. This notion yeah. about you know how traditionally academic libraries are risk averse. So why are we now? acting and I do think like you know there's a lot of contextual stuff obviously the policy landscape is a big impetus for action but it is interesting to think about like what you need to let go of in order to do something like this so Bethany I think you had mentioned about um, how you define failure and the notion or threat of that and how you work within that and I've been kind of consumed with thoughts about that throughout the course of developing um, this project because conscious that when you've got you know 18 partners there and you really don't want it to go um, awry at all but I think it's that there needs to be a kind of awareness that you know none of these projects are, are purporting to solve everything or be you know the, the final solution that makes academic publishing easy straightforward cost effective and you know everybody uh, skips around uh, joyously because of it like we can't do that with one single project but we can iterate and move towards a, a more favourable environment by all um, working together and maybe releasing some of that notion of um, f- like seeing anything different to exactly what you set out to achieve is failure. Just be embrace that as something that's got uh, things uh, moved on. Um, so that's maybe turned into more of a... Um, a journey into my psyche than it needed to be but I think like that the point going back to the original point which is around how a network could support that because sometimes just knowing you know that you, you've got a sounding board and that you've got mm-hmm. other people that you can rely on can be um, really effective in moving mm-hmm. things forward and giving mm-hmm. that degree of confidence. Yeah yeah well Michael Williams who asked that original question about risk taking risks um uh, says it's not really about OA, but about institutions themselves. We are, uh, our institutions are risk averse. Um, and uh, I think, well, certainly what we've learned at Sussex, it's about a, 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 a level that you take it to within, that's what, what is within your gift. And then you can use that to evidence taking more of a risk. Um, but we've certainly seen a change. I, I don't know if that's the same for everybody else. And Graham Stone, um, Suzanne says, he'd love to add case studies to JISC's new university press toolkit. Um, so there is that, which I'm sure you're all aware of. Um, there's lots of support for networks. Uh, uh, a question from, from Francesca, Francesca Casadati. Sorry if I said that wrong. Um, uh, this is how this is about quality, actually. Um, so how so can you expand on how you engage academics and in particular peer reviewers? Quality of publications is given by the quality of the reviewers. How do you guarantee quality, which is a perennial open access challenge isn't it a challenge to open access anybody want to answer that one I don't Beth. want to answer that I'm super keen to hear what um <laughs> I have to say because this is mm. again we're right at the start of this mm. um and it's been really exciting uh, eye-opening hearing from our authors saying we've loved it when it's been like this we've hated it when it's been like this but um yeah we're not really sure how to put that into a process just yet yeah. Um, so as I mentioned, we're a hosting service and not a publisher, so we don't deal directly mm. with peer review, mm. but we do try to provide guidelines and as much support for the journal editors so that they handle peer review appropriately. So we always try to encourage, um, well, we have a publication ethics statement for peer reviewers and for editors in managing that peer review. Um, we ask them to create peer review statements and guidelines, and also just to be mindful that a lot of this work is done unpaid and <laughs> just be nice <laughs> to peer reviewers um so we just we just try to um provide as much support as possible but as i say we're not directly engaged in the peer review itself thanks rebecca Gillian, did you want to add to that um no so i guess we're just not again we're not at the stage where we've uh, got our peer review um, process in place we are just uh, recruiting our editorial board and i think as we've put out that call and um, we're kind of keen to make them see it as contributing to that that process it's not about that th- there will be um clear ideas imposed upon them but we would want to see that that first editorial board almost in, in involved in a, a kind of startup phase of setting that in place so that's all still up for discussion as far as we're concerned okay thank you Gillian um a question from Rosie Higman uh 
so this is about message and probably talks to the brand stuff that, that you've spoken about, Rebecca. Um, so it sounds as though each initiative is offering slightly different services under the umbrella of publishing, presumably along, yeah, alongside data and publication repositories. Is there a concern about this being confusing for academics? How do we clarify what type of publishing service is being offered? And you must have had to dealt with that, deal with that, Rebecca, with your branding. Um, do you want to go first? Yeah, sure. So um, again, this was one of the many reasons we did rebrand and give our service a name because we are based on the, um, I say we, I am based on the scholarly communications team um, who also deal with repositories um, and open access in general. So um, I think having a strong, clear brand and a name is good because um, that helps people differentiate it. And the clearer the name is, the better. Um, and also just outreach, just telling people the different options, what they're for, I think there is confusion, um, as Rosie has mentioned, for academics and also for ECRs and students who are maybe starting to get to grips with it. So I think just creating hubs, any kind of resource um, is always a good thing. Although I'm aware universities have so many web pages and they can be very difficult to navigate sometimes. But um, but yeah, I just think clear branding, resource hubs and outreach has, has been helping us with, with our rebrand, yeah. Anybody else want to come in on messaging? I was just going to make it. Oh, sorry, Julian, do you want to go? No, first? no, on you go, Susanna. It was just a quick comment. I just, I think, um, I just think there's a, a huge variety with what academics are after and their their reasons for wanting to do an open access publication. So I just think, like the, the two examples that we drew on earlier, there was we had a, a researcher who just just wanted all of the hosting and all of the stuff thought it out for her she just didn't really want to have to think about it but she just needed her publication to go live so that she could do this whole other bit of work around it she was doing she just wanted all the hassle taken out of it and then I suppose the other end of the scale we've got an academic who wants to absolutely be in there doing it using this um, new, new software because they can see value for what they're doing so I just I think there's a really big spectrum when it comes to uh, researchers in what they might go for and their reasoning behind it and we won't I don't think certainly with what we're doing we won't meet everybody's needs but I think we are just part of the we could be part of the infrastructure but I don't think we would be claiming to fulfill everybody's uh, requirements with what we're doing. Thank you. Gillian? Um, yeah I was just going to say so we've um, just completed a, a comm strategy which is quite a detailed um, piece of work because we're really conscious that getting the message right is, is key to all this. I think there is already quite a lot of confusion um, from academics about how they meet funder requirements around open access in the first place so you don't the, the last thing we want to be doing is um, creating another layer of complexity so how we're managing that is that all of the um, communications are, are produced centrally okayed by our management board and then sent out to partner institutions to use as a template or to suit their own local context but it keeps the core messaging the same so that we're not um, having different uh, notions of what we're trying to deliver and um, spread around there so that's the approach that we'll be embedding throughout uh, to try and uh, try and manage those issues. Thanks Gillian. Um, there's a uh, there's a comment there from Graham Stone telling, reminding us all that there's a, a new IFLA special interest group on library publishing with a link. Um, a comment from Stephen Fidovich from Southampton say, saying that there are reputational risks associated with not having formal structured policies and guidance. It could be a good idea to become appealing to the risk averse sides of universities. And certainly from my experience, um, uh, uh, it, it's, that's a good comment uh, from my experience uh, the, the library is a trusted service uh, and just we are trusted to to deliver um and so uh yeah in, in that respect we are we are more appealing than say it um but every single institution as i said right at the beginning of this presentation is going to have a different flavor and a different culture um and so yeah it's going to work differently in it which is why this is really interesting. Um, I have a question uh, about discoverability of outputs. Um, uh, so, so does anyone see a risk to the discoverability of outputs in the future for those initiatives with limited time frames? Is that something you're building into your planning, Gillian? 
Um, so we've been really fortunate to have um, the support uh, from uh, the National Library of Scotland, basically saying that anything that uh, anything that is um, produced will be uh, brought into their their processes, so mm. that we've got that kind of long term uh, mm. preservation security built in uh, to the project. Uh, beyond that, we that's you know that's obviously a great thing uh, to have. Um, but beyond that, we've not. Um, looked at any any more specifics around around that. Rebecca. Um, yeah, so we have started hosting more and more conference papers, and we are looking into um, launching a, a conference hosting system as well. So a lot of these are just one off um, papers. Um, they're not serials, so they don't need ISSNs or whatever. But we do for all our content. We have our own preservation system at Edinburgh. We also have an arrangement with locks. The lots of copies keep stuff safe. Mm. And we're in the process of registering our content to the PKP preservation network. So we're just doing as much as possible to prevent link rot or to prevent um, content from getting lost, web pages just dying away, never to be seen again. So um, it's something we very much have in mind. And the more that we do host those one-off projects, including some of the books and the conference proceedings, um, yeah, the more we'll will ensure everything's preserved and archived appropriately. Thank you, Rebecca. Beth? Yes, yeah, so it is a concern, particularly for a pilot project, so we don't necessarily know what's going to happen, and it may be that we don't develop a service. Um, on a very kind of um, narrow local level, the fact that we know that this is going to be used for essential teaching for um, a massive cohort, psychology, first year cohorts, like 900 students, so it's going to get looked at, which is brilliant. And if it becomes embedded in a central part of that teaching as resource, then that sort of guarantees mm. a bit of longevity, but on that local kind of level. But of course, we're making sure that we have authors contributing who are um, also working at um, BPA accredited, no, what's it called? British Psychological Association, that's it, yes. Um, accredited institutions. And so mm. hopefully then the title can get picked up there. And then that then hopefully then builds in um, some longevity to the title. But yes, there are bigger, bigger things to be thinking about um, in terms of preservation for us. OK, thank you. Uh, there are still questions that we, I'm afraid, won't be able to get to answer, but I'm going to finish with one final one and give you all a chance to answer it, which is about staffing. Um, uh, so from Claire Grace, how could I ask how you are staffing your publishing services? I know some of you've mentioned this in your presentation. Does staffing come from within existing capacity or are you creating, planning to create new posts? And there's an additional one there. How important is the experience of commercial academic publishing to the ex success of your endeavours? Um, Gillian. Yeah, so we're kind of a mix. The, the vast majority really um, of work so far has been sourced from across the Scurll network, but we just took on a, a publishing officer on the 1st of March. So she's um, just been in post for a couple of weeks now. Um, we were also looking at um, another role to support the, the, the hosting of the platform. So we, we will have a mixed model between dedicated staff, but actually for, you know, an a, a um, initiative of that size that's probably not it's not very many um, paid staff so that the kind of uh, input of the network will still be really important throughout the course of the project. Thanks Gillian. Rebecca? Um, yeah so as I mentioned our service launched uh, 10 years or so ago and it was some part of someone's role as they did their main job so it was only in the last um four-ish years where they created a role specifically to um, grow this service or implement first and then I've come on to, mm. to grow the service so um, yeah and one day a week of tech support as I said so in terms of the experience of commercial academic publishing so I was in academic publishing for almost eight years before joining the library right. and I would argue that I do feel, um, I'm going to toot my own horn, I do feel I have brought a lot of value mm -hmm. to the role with that knowledge. Um, I've implemented publication ethics statements, um, annual reporting, indexing, um, ensuring the journals really are industry standard and high quality. Um, although a lot of work around that had already been done, which gave me a great, you know, um, starting point. So I would argue it is important, but I don't see why librarians couldn't learn it as well like if you look at alps they do plenty mm. of um workshops where you can go and learn about academic publishing and then apply that knowledge to your services 
So I do think maybe not experience of it, but knowledge of it and um, a commitment to learning about it is important um, personally. Thanks, Rebecca. I would agree. Beth, Suzanne? Beth, do you want to go? Um, so we have a fixed term part time person um, and it's a lot and um, it's difficult to guess about it because Jane and Susanna are on the call and I hope that they might be able to <laughs> expand those hours. That, well, we can discuss that later. Um, but it's, <laughs> it's definitely a lot and I think the agile approach for us makes it when you're thinking about um, staffing resource a bit more tricky to plan in because things will change mm. and requirements um, increase. Um, I've read Claire's question about the experience of commercial publishing complete, like, well, completely differently. Um, so I was just going to say that the academic experience of commercial publishing and the increased awareness of textbook costs is probably what's got people excited about mm. what we're doing. So that experience is very helpful. <laughs> Thanks, Beth. And Suzanne, the last word. Yeah, I was just going to add that um, uh, Graham Stone mentioned earlier about the new university press toolkit. And again, you know, we were starting this without anybody in the team who had worked with the publishers or had that experience. So actually that toolkit was really, really helpful for us. And just think about actually what are all the things that we need to be, be, be thinking about that. So I, I'd, I'd recommend that to anybody who's starting out and um, wanting to think about what, what they need to think about with, with this sort of project. Uh, and, and, I, and I I will add, if I may, uh, in response to what Beth said, that one of the things we, we we want to do in order to continue with stuffing our publishing service is to think about what we do with our Elsevier savings. So to make sure that that gets pushed into uh, open access infrastructure.